welcome everyone to uh, week three of our mini course uh, on uh, excavating in the Temple of Moot. I hope everyone is well and as enjoying still being at home. Uh, so I, uh, I, I think we're looking forward very much to Salima Ikram joining us, uh, hopefully on the half hour. Um, and so to begin to use our time, um, I'm going to start by talking about the work that we did uh, conserving, uh, excavating and conserving in the temple. Um, I did speak to you a little bit about this last week and you saw uh, the limestone blocks uh, and a little bit of the column drums uh, that we found in that time. Um, but today I want to show you uh, a bit more about that um, and really putting it into the context um, of our overall theme, which is how many uh, people it takes to actually do excavation and analysis of material. So last week we were lucky enough um, to, to hear from Chris Strutt uh, and Dave Anderson about um, ground penetrating radar, about um, magnetometry and ERT um, to investigate beneath our, uh, our walking surfaces. And you heard from Dave about uh, making 3D models um, of the temple and of the blocks um, that I'm going to now show you the conservation for so that we can actually begin to consider um, the architecture of the original Hatshepsut temple um, and try to reconstruct it if possible um, on uh, at least um, on the screen um, and on paper. And um, so we're going to uh, look at the way that the temple was deeply threatened um, by rising water table uh, which has been the case in Egypt ever since the building of the Aswan Dam um, and its opening um, around 1970. Um, the, the stone in the foundation levels of the Mut Temple, um, which is frankly on very shallow uh, sand foundations and ought to be on, have been on deeper ones when it was originally built, um, has turned into sand uh, when we started working there in 2004. So here you see a block of Hatshepsut um, in front of, um, of the goddess Mut. Um, and as you recall, we began to remove that, uh, that porch um, so that we could rebuild. It was then waterproofed before they began to re rebuild um, with newly quarried stone as well as that uh, which had been uh, was uninscribed and but could be replacement for it uh, and here's you see it in, in the process or just after it had been uh, rebuilt with that new and reused stone <clears throat> now the material that we found during this time period represented almost certainly the front porch area of Hatshepsut and Thutmose III's temple, which had been partially taken down um, under Taharqa's reign around 700 BC, so that he could extend the porch um, and actually add uh, columns in front of it. So that's the moment when you realize when you have all these blocks um, that are all decorated, many of them inscribed as well, um, that this is a job that really requires the experts. And so from a, for more than five years, um, we had a wonderful team of conservation people um, coming from all over. You see Hiroko Kariya, um, who, um, is, who came to us from Japan, although she also works at the University of Chicago, Chicago House. And um, you see Kent Severson from the Boston Museum of Art of Fine Arts um, also working. Um, and they spent enormous amounts of time on each of these blocks. And I'm gonna show you now really very rapidly a little bit of, of before and after. So here's a block that came from one of the square pillars um, of Thutmose the uh, third or Hatshepsut uh, in front of the goddess Mut. Um, and when it was first found. And here it is after their cleaning. Now I wanna 
immediately tell you they did not put any color on here. This is exactly what was there. All they did was clean. So you're seeing a pretty remarkable transformation that is entirely mechanical or, or chemical in the sense of if chemicals were needed. Here's a large four-sided uh, four, four block, um, actually recarved for Ramses III, um, showing Moot in front of the god Amun. And here's a close-up of it. And here it is um, on once they cleaned it. And one of the other sides is what you see here on the left. Um, and here's a large wall block that was found actually lying down, face down um, on the ground, uh, right in the center, central axis of the temple. Uh, and there you see Hiroko um, doing some beginning cleaning on it. And then you see it um, after it has been cleaned. Uh, here's another block that shows the uh, head of, of actually Thutmose III uh, in the process of being cleaned by one of our interns. And here it is in the aftermath. And part of the larger scene it was in uh, is the foot of the king running. There's another large four-sided block, which was in absolutely terrible condition, so terrible that we really couldn't move it for a very long time. It had to be uh, wrapped together carefully um, and then was moved and uh, very, very nearby for more than a year uh, before they ever removed it, the, the cloth on it to start doing work. And this is as, the, as they're finally removing the cloth um, and going to actually treat it. Um, and here is that the block before the final cleaning really began after it had been sitting for more than a year. And here is that face of that block. Um, and here is another face of the same block. Uh, one last one we have um, is the block that was still in situ, as you see it here on the left. Um, not uh, enormously in bad shape, but um, it certainly still cleaned up uh, very, very well. So all of this material, as I said last week, was then moved to an area we, we excavated and then laid out to be, um, uh, to be an open air museum area. Um, it's now been roofed over. Um, and we have altogether about 125 um, blocks um, maybe 75 of those, which are really large sized. And here in this aerial, you can see it on the top left, that area before uh, the roofing was placed on it. Now I wanna talk a little bit about features of these blocks that um, are not just about what's represented, but also tell us a good deal about the history of this temple um, and particularly about its early history. So I showed you this one last week. This is a two-sided block. Um, one of the nicest things about these blocks um, is that we can actually get a reconstruction of an entire scene um, because um, the Egyptian decoration scenes are so predictable um, and, uh, and in many ways repetitive. Um, and so we can actually do a reconstruction of what scenes we have, and we can even draw um, much of the scenes for the whole wall um, very, very easily um, as a result of having uh, just a single block like this. But there's another aspect um, that, we've, uh, well, that we have found, and that is that if you look at some of the blocks that come out, they routinely show um, significant amount of damage. Now, in many cases, you would expect that this damage might have been done by the uh, King Akhenaten's people, which happened somewhere around 1350 BC, um, because of his great antipathy towards the god Amun-Re and Mut um, and their offspring Khonsu. So we are used to seeing damage inflicted um, by Akhenaten's people. But this is not the damage of that type. Um, and instead, what you're looking at above here um, is actually a, a lintel 
um, that has a, um, that was a double lintel. So in the middle, uh, in the middle here, you would have, you have, uh, sorry, it's over here. In the middle, you would have had um, the word life, just like you see it here. And then running this way, you had the name of King Thutmose III. But on the other half of this lintel, you had the name of Hatshepsut. And everywhere that Hatshepsut's presence had been, um, has been cut out. Um, now, the same is true when you look at this vertical doorway piece, where on the left-hand column, you had the name of Thutmose III, and it has been preserved, but on the right, um, it has been completely carved um, away so that it is not uh, visible at all and, and simply missing. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that we actually know a whole series of techniques that were used by Thutmose III's architects during the period that he was sole ruler in order to get rid of Hatshepsut and also take over her monuments. And they are, there are quite a few of them. One of them you just saw, which was just to simply completely carve away hers. And what they would have done in that case um, is to fill in with plaster and then, um, uh, and then recarve. But another system that they used at, down in Nubia at Buhan, where she built a significant temple to the god Horus, was that they actually would remove an entire section where the queen was represented. Here she's holding calves by leashes. And then they would make a new block that represented Thutmose III, and it would be inserted. And we find that that exact same thing was being done at the Temple of Mut, where here, the entire section where Hatshepsut was uh, placed was cut out and it would have then um, been filled in um, by, um, uh, by a small block uh, that took over um, for her and would have put Thutmose III in her stead. Now, another thing that we find is that these blocks actually tell us a great deal about what sorts of um, architecture uh, rep was represented in the temple. Um, and here we have the remains of square pillars that were frequently used in the period of Thutmose III um, and Hatshepsut. This is her temple at Deir el-Bahri. There are square pillars in front of it. And from the Mu temple, they chopped these, these square pillars into blocks and used each and every one of them in this foundation uh, of the late 25th dynasty. So we have the portions of at least five uh, square pillars. Um, we think that probably there were four self-standing ones and one that was actually attached um, to the actual walls of the temple. And that's one of the things that we'll be testing out um, with Dave Anderson's photogrammetry. So let me talk further about what we did in terms of excavating inside the temple. Now, if you recall last week, I showed you that um, when we had removed the front wall and started to dig in a single room behind that front wall of the porch, um, we discovered not only limestone blocks, but also sandstone column drums. And it turned out that they went well beyond um, the porch itself and into the main portion of the temple. This is the wall that separated the porch from the inside of the temple. And here is the beginning of the actual sandstone platform on which Hatshepsut's temple had been built. So it was, this was actually used, these column drums were used to extend the width of the actual platform itself when they were uh, taken down. So we knew right away that they, there were things buried beneath uh, the temple. And so we began to 
look for other possible places that we might be able to see some of the history of the temple. So if you then sort of take what we found and put it into the negative uh, photograph, uh, what you see over here are all of these stone features which were buried, the column drums, etc. cetera. Um, but you also then begin to see in front the remains of mud brick, which are underneath, even at a deeper level, uh, in the, under the porch. Um, and when you begin to look more carefully, you see that the mud brick is actually shaped. And it is shaped like a gate, which is in fact, it is, and it is right along the exact same central aisle of the temple once it was built in stone. So as we dug beneath the, these are the columns that stood on the porch. Originally they held square pillars and then they were replaced by round columns under Amenhotep III. And underneath all of that, we began to find mud brick. And here is the mud brick remains of the mud brick gateway. Now what's interesting is that we can date this by pottery to late second intermediate period but I'm sure all of you can see that there is yet another mud brick wall down further. So we have actually um, remains of an even earlier portion of something. I'm not saying that that's temple, um, but it is a mud brick wall running in a very different direction from the mud brick gate. Now, this is just another close up um, of what would be the Eastern side of this gate. So here again, you can see uh, a little bit more closely what we were uh, what we were finding, and here, um, what we found is that mud brick runs all the way across uh, the front portion of the um, of the porch um, at very deep levels, and probably formed um, in addition to the gateway, which is is now. Um, up in here, it probably formed an actual platform or possibly um, even a mud brick pylon, um, which had been completely cut down. So you can see on this drawing the, where the remains of the mud brick um, has been found. Now, of course, we can only dig where there is not a stone uh, in the way, and we did not, we made the decision we would not dismantle the temple in order to just follow the brick. But it is enough for us to be quite clear that there is um, a, a considerable structure down beneath. <clears throat> so what we found here is our mud brick gate in this region, um, a mud brick platform with an uncertain size, although we have found evidence for it outside the porch as well. So it was considerable. Um, and based on the fine place of our uh, stone drums, we believe that they represented the Hall of Drunkenness, which was here on the western side um, of the temple um, in, in the time of Hatshepsut. All of this suggests that there had also been a mud brick temple um, here. Um, in the time uh, earlier, at least, than the New Kingdom. And there is now reason to think that it also dates um, as early as the Middle Kingdom. The reason I can say that is that in our platform clearance during in 2007, um, it was found deep in the platform, a small limestone fragment from what is probably a stela, um, um, or perhaps the back uh, of a statue, um, but it names a king um, who is called the son of Ray, and this is definitely an S, the word Usur, which means powerful, the name, the beginning of the name of a number of kings of Egypt, Senwazeret, um, and underneath it, the top of the, the Yod and the Shin, which is the beginning of the way you write the name Isheru. 
So it is almost certainly the case that um, there was in the Middle Kingdom, possibly 12th dynasty, um, a temple to the goddess Mut of Isheru, that is our sacred lake, um, already. And that would make, push its date back to somewhere around 19 to 1800 BC, um, certainly earlier than any, uh, any other time. And um, I'm happy to say that this has really very much been accepted now. Um, uh, the Fazinis include this in their documentation. They, they are convinced that we have um, already now pretty clear evidence that we have a 12th dynasty mud brick temple um, to the goddess Moot lying beneath. So to sort of um, get to, um, to where we are now um, at an ending um, of this section, um, here is what the front porch looked like in 2003, just before we started work, before we started to dismantle this wall and that all the way across. And of course, the excavation that we've been talking about has come about from here and from here. And that's what it looks like today. Um, we have rebuilt the front uh, porch wall and the columns that were discovered have been put back together by Frank Burgos, uh, a fine stonemason um, from the French at Karnak. Um, and uh, they now allow us to get a sense of the actual height of the temple. Um, although um, we probably, there's, there's certainly not where they were originally, but we wanted to have them because our walls are so poorly represented um, that we, uh, with this way, you have some sense of what the actual height was um, in the 18th dynasty. So everybody, um, this is Dr. Salima Ikram, who is the Distinguished University Professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo. And um, I, I know that any of you who are familiar with Egypt at all uh, know Salima's name. She's sort of synonymous these days with Egypt and Egyptology. Um, and we are really thrilled that you're here. She's kindly given her time um, to work with us off and on, on first on animal bones um, and then on uh, human bones, which to be quite honest, we really uh, didn't expect to get at all. Um, and uh, I thank her and I thank Roxy Walker, um, uh, who's the director of the Bioarchaeology Institute um, for having come to our rescue um, on many, many, many occasions and continue to do so. So Salima, um, would you like to to speak about our our work, or do you want me to set it up? Oh, um, do you? Yeah. Why don't you set it up, Betsy, and um, I will leap in whenever we get to gruesome bits. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's the uh, drawing. And, and, and uh, I just uh, want to say to everyone. <laughs> Here's the drawing from, uh, for, that shows the variety of squares that we worked in between 2002 and 2012, or 15, sorry. Um, and um, the, the one that we want to sort of bear, look at is um, this one. Square number nine is what we're going to be first talking about. And then after that, all of these squares produced human remains, but number nine is what we're really going to be focusing on first. So everybody has now gotten used to seeing our industrial area, our bakeries, our breweries, and even our area, which may have been a ramp that led to this industrial area. Here is an over aerial shot showing you once more um, the exact location of um, square number. Uh, nine in this eastern area um, where we are going to be focusing our attention. 
And this is square nine, where I showed this to you last time, um, showing the two column bases that we found in C2 um, that would have held wooden, um, uh, wooden columns that probably supported uh, a small kiosk where the overseer sat uh, in order to, uh, to be cooler as he watched the people processing grain. And you'll notice that in between, there's an area here um, that has some, some dry dirt on it, and that is the area that we actually made uh, a very um, odd and unexpected discovery. And here's the idea of the kiosk, and here um, is where we began, begin to now look. Um, in terms of stratigraphy, we are with the column bases, early 18th dynasty, probably the time of Hatshepsut and Thutmose III co-regency, but immediately under, we are in the late second intermediate period or very early 18th dynasty. Um, and all of the pottery is a reflection of that. In fact, if you look in the bulks, the pottery, look here, the pottery is so thick they actually scooped it up in the early 18th dynasty and used it to support and raise the floor level to begin to build on. And it is in this environment that we began to find something quite odd. Okay. All right. So, Salima, would you like to go from here? Okay, sure. Um, so, Betsy had found part of a burial and she called over Roxy Walker first and then I joined Roxy because we were working on the other elsewhere. Um, but what Betsy had found was this head and parts of a skeleton, but it, the way it was laid was really bizarre because it wasn't following what would we would call a normal anatomical layout. Um, so Ro Roxy had gone to see this and she came back and she said, I think you better come because I'm, I, I'm seeing things. Um, <laughs> and so we came and, um, and saw things together and said, oh, this is really weird. Um, and I think we didn't finish because we thought that would require so much more work. And we were actually working with Jose Galan at the time. We said to Betsy, maybe you can leave it and we can come back. Um, and because this looked quite complicated and very important. And so we decided to come back in the summer. So there we were in the middle of July or June or something hideous. Um, digging things up and as we got down we started to define this skeleton and what was quite interesting was we we found that it was definitely not in a normal anatomical position the head was off to one side the arms were behind the back and the knees were sort of pulled up in an uncomfortable and hideous way and the head had probably been twisted and pushed back. And um, we spent a lot of time digging this up, trying to be very careful because it was a, clearly a very unusual burial. And it wasn't as if this had fallen in this way. It had been deliberately placed, as it were, or at least the, the limbs were situated. So as I was digging near the pelvis, I mean, I was, it was the, the, the flesh, the, the sort of, around the body, there was a darker, colored um, mud, whatever, deposit. And that we basically figured was the flesh. And then as I was going down to what turned out to be the pelvis, I was digging away my face in the dirt and I was pulling things out and it was really hard and encrusted, which made me, and I was thinking, oh my God, it's terrible. Why is it so hard here? And I thought, looked up because I was high level. And I thought, oh, that's where he voided himself when he, died. Um, so I had basically been going through his last bowel movement. Um, and that is a, a useful thing for people who excavate. Remember not to put your face too close to the nether regions of a skeleton unless it's been mummified, um, because it can get quite unpleasant. But 
it was also interesting to find that that was the only place where you had that hard deposit because it meant that the person had probably died there in situ and this had occurred at the time of death. So that gave the whole positioning a greater idiocy. Next slide, please. Okay. So here's our, are you ready for our video? So basically what happens is we think that this person was tied up, really hog tied with the back of the feet and the hands, and then stood up with a st probably attached to a stake. And then whoever was the executioner came and it's quite difficult to balance without a stake. Um, basically turned them around and uh, snapped the neck. And you can see where the vertebrae have broken and where part of the jaw got crushed with the force of the trauma. And then the person was, they took the stake off, they just him for dead. Well, he was very dead. Um, over there on that column base that had been turned into a stakeholder. So please notice where the executioner's knees were in the small of the back and how that would push down. And that also is what told us uh, we could recreate it by the, the levels in which the different vertebrae were deposited. All right, so do we want to talk about the identity of our victim? So um, what one of the things basically, the first thing was we, realized that this was someone who had been killed very deliberately, executed. Um, and we had the place where the stake would have been put into the column, the former column base. And the person would have been tied up and left there for a while um, before being killed brutally. Now, who are these people who would be um, killed in this way? And you can see from the text over here, um, you have the punishment of the state for anyone who is a rebel or any different criminal. And there are lots of types of criminals who would be punished in this way, either first only staked out. It's a bit like being in the stocks, except even nastier. Um, but then this person was actually killed. So we're in second levels. So of course, this made us all start to think about would it be someone from the Hyksos who would have been punished in this way? Because of course, foreign prisoners are going to be your first choice, as you can see here. Now, it's very difficult from skeletons um, to tell where they are from. Their ethnicity is not always easy to judge, although some work has been done on it. And even in those of you who know the great handbook for skeletal identification, Bill Bass, he does give some basics of skull types for saying, you know, whether you are from Sub-Saharan Africa, whether you're parts of China, whether you are um, Caucasian, etc. But these are things that are not entirely reliable. There are some things that are. Um, I mean, teeth are something that are quite useful. Um, generally, Sub-Saharan African spade-shaped te teeth is a good way of, of, of judging things. But if you're trying to find someone who is Hyksos, how are you going to do it just from the skeleton? In an ideal world, we could have done isotope analysis and we would know if this person had been living in the Nile Valley or not. But unfortunately, as you all know, we're not allowed to take any samples out of Egypt. And at this point, there are no labs here. They were hoping to move towards that where you could do either strontium or oxygen isotope analysis. So by looking at people's diet, you, couldn't, you can't do anything. Um, so we are really basically left with the bones themselves and what the morphology. And there is a person 
uh, a couple of people who've been trying to work on tooth morphology to try and identify whether someone comes from the Near East or Egypt, which is a bit tricky anyway, um, or Sub-Saharan Africa or further, further, further east in China. Um, and this person is called Joel Irish, and he has been looking at teeth. And um, do you have the next slide? I do, but I don't know that I have his him on here. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. This is go okay. ahead and talk um, about it. I can show the. Uh, there's the head. Okay. You can talk about it with the teeth. Yeah, let's. Yeah, that's fine. So looking at the teeth now, Joel thinks, but this is not proven. He looked at it and he thought that it, the form of the, the teeth and the way the cusps are on the molars, etc., it looked as if it could be, there was a high probability that it was a Near Eastern person. But you have to realize that this is not 100% um, sure by any chance. And Joel will be the first person to say that he himself is not 100% sure. He is fairly well well convinced it is and it would make sense but of course in Egypt the problem is that it was such a mixed bag of humanity here and, and many most times that it doesn't necessarily mean that someone who's Near Eastern is necessarily Hyksos. So given the situation, the circumstance of the discovery, the positioning, the time period, it certainly would make very good sense that this was someone who was a foreigner who was being punished in a very extreme manner. So I think that um, we were, you know, as you can see from the text on the slide, is this a ritual deposit or an execution punishment? And it seemed to be more like an execution punishment um, because of just being left there. There were some sherds thrown over it quite quickly and it was buried rather quickly because after a while, you know, you had your execution, you've thrown things at the prisoner, and then you just want them to be covered up because of course the stench is going to be awful. It, the animals that are going to come and attack it are going to be problematic. So if this is still within an urban framework, like maybe it was a small square or whatever, or in front of an administrative building where you want to make a point, you might want people to remember that this happened this person's buried there, but you don't want the body hanging around and you don't want to give it a decent burial because of course you're trying to punish the person. So that is where we are at with this particular extraordinarily interesting case. One other has been that somewhat like it has been reported by some of the people working in the temple of Amenhotep II on the other side of the river, but from the pictures and from what they describe, it's not quite the same positioning. So uh, I don't, Roxy and I and Betsy are not really convinced that it is the same thing at all. I think it's someone who's been thrown into a place who fell at an awkward angle because the arms are outflung and so it's not all trussed up the way this one is very clearly trussed up. Yes, so it's a very fascinating situation. And as Salima said, it's not a burial. Uh, the person was left where he was executed and like she said, thrown pottery thrown over. Um, and then perhaps the column bases were put in very soon thereafter. This is something that is very difficult for us to be 100% certain about, but um, it is uh, highly interesting to see that they're within a few inches um, of his body, the way those two column bases on either end, and he is right between them. And, and you know, that makes it even more, argue, the, the argument more forceful that this is someone who was being punished in a sort of more treasonous kind of thing and to put a position of authority over him right. emphasizes that. Okay, well, that's great. So we're going to move on and talk about um, other, uh, other places that we have um, found human remains and uh, some of this 
um, involved um, Salima uh, working with us and some of it involved other people. Um, but what became interesting is that uh, even this is the column, one of the two column bases that um, uh, framed um, our bound captive who was in here. Um, but right in the corner of that same square, um, a, a, you see a skull um, that almost fell out of the bulk um, and around it on the floor of this are these round, almost round, um, mud brick stones. I, I would have to say they're formed to look like stones rather than to look like bricks. Um, and they obviously formed some kind of enclosure for a burial, but we didn't figure that out for a really long time because we had ourselves a, uh, a, a person who was executed on the site, not a cemetery, not a burial, but almost immediately, um, this is still happened in 2011 that we found that, but the, almost immediately with 2012 starting, we started to find um, human remains almost everywhere. This one was to remind us that we might have had a Hyksos. <clears throat> so, um, so in 2012, we were digging down in areas beneath where the 18th Dynasty installations had been. Now we're certainly into real second intermediate period levels. Um, and we were finding things like animal troughs and what looks like perhaps even an animal pen here. Um, and very soon thereafter, um, our very, very careful um, gufties, our workers, actually, I began to see some light colored material that they identified as probably bone. Um, and you can just see the outline here uh, of bone uh, becoming visible. And of course, the next thing you know um, is that I called for Salima, who kindly <laughs> <laughs> came to uh, to to check this out. Um, I don't know if you you even have a memory of this, but do you? I uh, I remember sitting down with and then lying down with. There's a lot of lying down going on in Moot Temple, um, <laughs> but there were incredible things. Now, one of the things I just wanted to point I wanted to make is that, as Betsy said, this is really a settlement. And generally, we do not get burials in settlements. You will sometimes get burials in settlements in Upper Egypt. They tend to be of babies or young children. It is not common, and of course, you know, I say this with the caveat that we have not excavated enough settlement sites in Egypt to say anything, but it is generally from the ones that we do know about, it is uncommon to have a lot of burials within a settlement. And as you will see when, as the slide go on the remarkable thing overall that's striking is that most of the people who are buried here are either very young or very old so you're falling into two groups and it is really as if there was some sort of medical event maybe not so distant from what we are suffering through today where people who were particularly susceptible, which would always be the children and the elderly, um, were getting sick and dying. And maybe they were all being buried in settlement more because, A, because the children would be, um, but because also there were quite a few burials that were being required. And maybe for some reason people weren't going for the elderly to the usual place. I don't know. Um, because we haven't exposed enough of the site to start making large scale generalizations, but it is notable that we have both male, female, but generally under sort of six years old or else over 35, 40 years old. And for ancient Egypt, that was quite old. Um, and some of the bodies have been damaged as you will see. And there are questions of whether these are reburials or 
whether it was hasty burials or something. So there clearly is a larger story to be told that these bodies are trying to tell us, um, which we are slowly going through and decoding. And also, of course, as we look at each individual burial, we're not only looking at positioning, um, but so the disease, the age and the sex and so forth um, in an effort to re reconstruct bigger, a greater understanding about the population as a, of a, as a whole, as opposed to just the individual. Um, and there are also, as you will see, some rather odd things um, coming up, but we'll get to those. Sorry. <laughs> to That's okay. On right. So you can see that that's Maggie and myself with, um, and Afaf Wahba and Jessica Kaiser. We were all people who were working here. Um, but as I said, there are child burials. And of course, many of them, annoyingly, half of them were in the box. And then we had to, um, poor archaeologists had to bring things down. Um, but it was remarkable to find so many bodies in a settlement site. And as I said, again, having the children, as you can see here, and there was one which had this little quartz bead. Look at the little the... quartz bead. And it's yeah, okay. there it is. There's a little quartz. Um, so, I mean, and it's, it's really quite touching because the adults didn't really have as much in the way of that much in the way of brave goods, but you know, the little beads and things that the children had was really touching because obviously people were caring for them and trying to bury them. Um, as carefully as they could and sometimes unfortunately because of the bulk situation we only wound up with half of the body and you could see the rest of it going into the bulk um, and this was one of the cases with this this young person okay so now we're moving along and we begin to see things that we hadn't had any view of before um, and that is, we began to get features that are actually um, sort of round tumuli like, um, made of very hard compressed mud. Um, and it turns out that um, they contained um, uh, fragments of burials. Um, one of them we sort of completely had misinterpreted, and that's this one here. Um, and <clears throat> but eventually we got more of them, so we began to uh, be able to go back and and understand them um, a bit better. So, in this is the same location, and again, just what Salima said. There's a bulk, and there's a body coming out of a bulk. <laughs> um, it it, uh, it seems like it was always happening. Um, and one of the things is the positioning um, varied. Uh, there were some people, you know, who were lying completely on their backs, but there weren't that many of those. There were more people who were scrunched up like this and then we're going to get to legs up at some point um so. yeah so there were all all sorts of positions and there wasn't consistency always about um direction of head or whether you're facing east or west and that was a bit perplexing because first we got ah oh, yes we're getting a certain kind of pattern and then we would get a burial that broke that pattern um so it is Odd, and it doesn't fit what we get in other places, um, in other burials, uh, certainly in cemeteries, unless you are getting a major change depending on time of year. Uh, but these ones, all of these people seem to have been buried in relatively, within a shortish time frame. I mean, from the pottery, but she has a better than I do. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a... The only thing that we don't know, you know, we actually have a sort of two stacker, you know, one one burial and then another burial directly under yeah. it, um, but with a with a, with room between. So there's some time period going on, but 
uh, how long yeah. is a little difficult. But there again, see another another one coming out of a bulk. Uh, it just seemed like they were bulk. Yeah, yeah. And all of these bulk ones, you can see their their legs are bent, so they were really in a flexed position. Um, and it's not because they're children only that they were in flex position because we have plenty of other child burials um, or infant burials where they're lying on their backs. Yeah, and there we go, is legs up. Because this person, this is a very weird one, we still, the bone team is still discussing it because we can't quite figure out why the legs were so literally up. Um, as you can see in this it's image, into um, the legs here. So just so yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is just we don't have parallels, but I mean, so one of the thoughts was, you know, this is who was thrown in, and there was something behind where the legs are, so the legs couldn't lie down, and they just covered this person with dirt. But it, it's a really, you know, we we looked to see if there was any hip disease or drug disease would have made it impossible for this person to be laid out flat. Um, but we have found no trace of anything. So this remains a, a, a big question mark. Yeah. And we're still yeah. And I, I don't think it's, I know that, you know, concerns about whether or not it was haphazard. But the thing is that there, <clears throat> there's an actual mud brick built tomb for this person. It's the only place where we have a real tomb built um, and with real brick. <clears throat> so, I mean, there's the, the body right. put in there. The question is something dislodged it somehow. And uh, so. Yeah, no, I mean, that's why because it was in a constructed tomb, we figured, okay, maybe there is something that this person can't lie down and that's why we look for joint disease ah. carefully. because we thought you know maybe they can't be straight because there's something that's you know happened to and if it, it, it should have shown up in the bone because even if it was a soft tissue issue the bone would have shown some sort of uh, thing but it, it was a little bit um destroyed also so hard to see but i think we found some some trace um but we couldn't find anything so he remains a, a great mystery. You can just say that he was having a really good time in the afterlife. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so okay. then uh, we move into a um, slightly later time period, but in 2012, in this, um, in, in this particular square, um, we started to get the bottom half, uh, their legs, etc., of someone coming from the bulk. We had other um, uh, other bones, which you can actually see a set of teeth right up here. Um, and uh, so we, this was in 2012, but we didn't um, continue for a while. But 2014, we began to really go further. So. Here it is, here is that lower half of that body uh, in 2012. Now, did you wanna make any comments? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, yes, now we're getting to these other things where you start, you know, we've got these tumuli, but we're also getting um, ochre, as you can see, circled down here, and animal, some animal bones, and uh, bits of also, um, is part, parts of animal skulls, which is the kind of thing that you get with different types of Nubian groups. And ochre is quite interesting because I've been reading up about it. Um, it can act as an antiseptic as well as being used as a ritual kind of thing because of course the red color is supposed to be very potent with the whole idea of sun, blood, fire, all of those really strong things. And you do find those in Nubian burials. Um, and I can't remember, which, and certainly some stuff you get in secret burials as well. Um, so it seemed that there, we might be having, here's Jessica and Afaf, um, I believe looking over at uh, one of the, these burials. Um, so it seems that we have a diversity of, of ethnicities, certainly 
here and they are expressing their background in the way that they are buried so you are getting different groups of people and i think betsy you also had pottery to confirm all of this right, right. we did and uh, i'll show a, a little bit of that in in a bit so here you can see where we actually did see that same body half of a body can coming into what really turned out to be an actual another tumulus um, so here it is more or less uh, isolated now uh, and it crossed across a bulk so we had to sort of take that down here are the people that helped us out Jessica Kaiser and Afaf here Maggie Bryson and Meg Sweeney um, and you can see them uh, working away. Um, we also have uh, had a, uh, a single vessel uh, that was next to one of the um, uh, one of the burials here, and was put back together by this very nice young undergraduate, a uh, very eager undergraduate. He was quite pleased with his work at putting it back together for us. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to say that Luke, like so many Hopkins undergrads, uh, is finishing uh, medical school as we speak. <laughs> um, okay. and, uh, uh, but but he, we enjoyed having him very much uh, helping us out. So here you can see the tumulus and it became quite populated. Um, this is the guy that we'd had all along and I'm going to let uh, Salima talk about them uh, now, but you can see here's another um, one of these vessels and here is um, an infant burial and we have yet another uh, burial over here and we ended up with actually two infant burials, one another one there. What you want to say. I mean, Tumuli, uh, as you all know, I mean, are the uh, earliest form of burials in Egypt, but they are also something that persisted in Nubia um, into the 5th, 6th centuries AD, um, though generally you would not get this kind of a mass grave. But the fact that we have so many people in this grave was a bit worrying. In some places you could see that they'd been cut into the tumulus later on so it wasn't all one mass grave it was reused as it were but really an established burial site um, within this area and again it begs the question what was going on in the urban fabric at this time for all of these people to be buried here and their adults as well as um, children um, and this whole thing with the pottery is also quite nice. But I think we still have more questions than we have answers, um, which is always the way with archaeology. Um, but, and some of them, you know, no one showed huge signs of any, I can't remember because I would have to look at, I don't have all of the, the, the bone notes from the excavators. Um, but we have, you know, we know the ages, again, it's old and young, but I don't remember if anyone suffered from any particular disease. I mean, some people, some of the children had Cribra orbitalia, which is due to anemia, where you have little, you can tell because they're small, there's porosity in the eye orbits. Um, and that can be caused either from anemia or because you have bad nutrition. Um, but there weren't any any clear things. I think one or two of the people had Harris lines, which again is a malnutrition thing, but there was nothing in any of the skeletons. I think there might've been one or two broken bones at, at that had healed in antiquity. But aside from that, there was no remarkable trauma. There was no remarkable disease that um, leapt out at us. So there was no real immediate reason for why any of these people died. But as we all know that there was a high mortality rate for children up to the age of about seven. And um, right. basically after 45, the men and women, when women of course tend to die more because of childbirth. Yeah, so um, the only so thing to add go. here is um, in, in terms of the date of this burial, we got very fortunate um, in these two pots um, the, that we were able to put back together and you can see it here. Um, this is a type which is vertically striated, burnished 
vertically. You can just almost see it yourself um, on the image. Um, and uh, both the shape and, the, and that type of, of decoration are, are known quite prominently on the other side of the river um, here in Thebes at Drabal Naga, uh, dating to the 17th dynasty. Um, Ann Zeiler uh, published quite a lot uh, of this material and um, it allows us to really nail um, the, the date of, of, of this particular offering. Um, but that is a, an, a, an Egyptian pot. It is not uh, the case that it is um, only a foreign pot at all. And so that is one of the things that's interesting about the pottery from these burials is that it is a mixture of, um, of Egyptian late second intermediate period with uh, Nubian, uh, in particular, quote unquote, pangrave um, uh, pottery, which I'll show you um, in just a moment. There's the skeleton of the second child. Um, and there's the second adult, which as I remember, Salima, you and Roxy have gone back and forth over whether this is male or female. Yeah, yeah, because um, the things that would be telling us clearly are rather damaged. So the pelvis you can't really tell from. And um, the thing is that, um, for, so I'm going to just say I don't know how much people know, but generally when you're trying to sex something, someone, you try and use more than one particular uh, thing. So when you look at the skull, you'd look at the brow, you'd look at the eye, the orbits, and the how whether they're sharp or not. Um, you can look at the jaw and the mastoid process here, as well as at the pelvis. Now, that's all great until a certain age because when women go past menopause um, and if they continue living they start getting some of the male traits and so sometimes when you have elderly women skeletons they are not as clearly the pelvis might be the only thing that will be immediately female but the skull's not so much and people have found this out because they've actually been studying um, the skeletons of people from historic periods where you know because you know you've got church records and you've got their name and this that and the other um and when they look at the skeleton they'd say oh my goodness this should be a man and it turns out that it definitely is a woman and when you look at the pelvis it's female but the skull not so much so this is why um we have gone to and fro with this but i think we're um relatively happy with elderly female question mark <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. All right. Where. Yeah. No. I. I'm. I thought I had my Nubian pottery, but we'll get to it at some point. Um. So this one, as you can see. Uh, oh, sorry. No. And the other thing I was going to say is, you know, the uh, the 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 person who was half inside the tumulus and half out is also a bit. Oh yeah. Unnerving. Um, we don't quite know how they were being, why they were being buried in that way, or did they sort of hollow it out and shove them in, or what went on? So right, and that was true of the infants here. as well. One of the infants they actually dug into the tumulus and inserted uh, after uh, after the other person had been put in. So, so it, it, I mean, it could be that this sort of, this tumulus became a sacred site or an important burial site. And so to parade in there was a good thing. Um, even if you could just get part of yourself stuck in there. Um, I don't know. Um, it's but it, it, it's again, it's a weird thing. And it's not like a normal tumulus burial. So this was actually yet another bulk okay. um, head coming out of a bulk um, in 2012. Um, but much, much later, what we ended up with was uh, another tumulus, and that was a body um, in there. And as you can see, um, there was a second level above it with yet another body. So um, uh, we at the one of them turns out to be <clears throat> in a flexed position, and the other one in a sort of more extended, the one above in a more extended fashion here. 
<clears throat> yeah, and this is again another one on the left side, but flexed burial. Um, so when people say that you can date burials by body position, this site blows that out of the water. Um, so you should always remember that everything we say, take with a grain of salt. Right. Um, and many things that I have written in the past about mummies, I'm completely revising and one day we'll re redo the mummy book with more up-to-date, reliable information. But it's the exceptions, which are becoming myriad <laughs> to every rule. So here's a um, here's a slide that shows uh, pottery from where we saw those two um, those two two, uh, two people buried one above the other, um, but this would be could be anywhere could be any of these locations because all of the tumuli had a mixture of Egyptian and Nubian pottery. So wherever you see a red circle, we have um, we have Nubian pottery uh, represented. Um, and it has been studied um, now by Meredith Brand, who has looked at all of it and declared it um, almost, almost every shard uh, to be Pangrave um, Nubian, as opposed to uh, C group, which might be a little earlier, um, and or um, we have a few shards of Kerma ware, um, which is not unusual in the late late second intermediate period, but um, but clearly these people were um, making their own pots. These are cooking pots. They've been cooked in, and um, so these are the people who are actually residing in the area, and it is their ceramics mixed in with uh, Egyptian type. This is, I think, about the last one we're going to show, and it's at least extended, actually supine, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I'm showing this uh, for one of our, our uh, class members who, if she's ah. here, asked to see, um, uh, had heard about these, um, and I wanted to see this stone um, materials. Um, I don't think this is carnelian, I think it's garnet. Um, but what's interesting about this material- I don't know it's garnet. Pardon? Um, I don't think it's garnet. Garnets actually have to be much, tend to be smaller, Betsy, and they're- Oh, really? When they're found later, they're faceted. Ah, um, okay. I don't, I don't think so. All I right. don't think it's carnelian either, but it could could be, um, oh, what's, it could be a d very dark agate. Yeah, I'm oh, agate, sure. that's what I meant. I'm because sorry, I meant agate, in, in fact. But what's yeah. interesting is that yeah, no, I'm, I, it was accompanied by quite a lot of red seashells, and I suspect that this stuff was being picked up in the Wadi Hamamat and um, as people went back and forth. Um, but we do actually have quite a lot of, of shells. Um, maybe I shouldn't say a word since it's an animal mm -hmm. and you'll mm -hmm. tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. And I mean, the shells we have, are some of them are Red Sea and some of them might in fact come from deposits, but we don't have many of them in the Theban area where you actually have fossilized almost um, uh, oyster type shells, um, which is, but, but we've got things coming from the Red Sea, which is quite common in fact during this time period. Yeah, but I think you're right that it's agate. And we have, I didn't show it here, but there are quite a few more that are really the nodules themselves. Uh, so they're in, it's interesting material and it was found right yeah. in that same area, yeah. in the same second intermediate period levels. So the last mm -hmm. thing we wanna do just for a moment is that when Salima first started working with us, um, it was um, looking at our animal bones. And this is uh, this is she doing just that. Um, yeah, and I can in fact um, tell people a bit about the kind of amazing things we have, um, because of course 
there are so few supplement sites that we have that it is a joy to work here where we have good contexted material and of course it's quite an early day and we've got some fabulous stuff so um the most remarkable thing and you have to remember that you know now we think of it as a temple but it wasn't always like that obviously um we get quite a lot of cattle which means that maybe it was associated with the temple so there were people who were dependent um and who were eating from that but at the same time we have tons of pig bones I mean, lots and lots of pig bones, which is really interesting um, because, of course, there's that old trope that, oh, the ancient Egyptians didn't eat pigs. Of course, they did eat pigs. Um, and it is settlement sites such as these that prove it. Of course, if there is a lot of pork consumption going on, um, were these people normal people who worked for the temple or were they priests who were working for the temple? Kind of hard to tell. Um, because, of course, we know that in some cases, it, pork might have been prescribed for priests, but probably only at very particular times of year, not in general, because we know that, you know, the Temple of Seti I and other temples actually owned herds of pigs. Um, so it's quite, quite interesting. We have a lot of cows. We have pigs, um, which, in fact, rival sheep goat, which is what we normal settlement sites is a lot more sheep goat unless they are being provisioned by the state. Um, we have some donkey, um, not very many, but a few, um, very few dogs, and we have some fish. And what's quite notable was we had, in fact, small, smallish fish, which are usual, and we had a couple of tilapia, but we had more, and this is possible, um, because, yeah, here we go. Here, look at that. We have um, some large catfish and we also have some large um, latis, niloticus, um, which are nile per. And we also had some turtle. So that was quite nice where we had soft shell nile turtle being found here. So you're getting a, a quite a range of animal types being eaten here. I was surprised that we didn't have more in the way of tilapia, which is something, um, bulti fish, which is what people commonly catch now in Thebes and eat. Um, so it was more catfishy things um, and, and then the, the turtle, which could have been eaten or it could have been used for a variety of other purposes, um, including being eaten, but you have you can make things out of turtle bone and people have them as shields um, or they even have curiosities in some other countries you find them in temples being placed there as offerings if they're a bit more exotic. Well, thank, thank you. you.